Hello and welcome to a talk on regulation for nurses and midwives. So I'm both a nurse and a midwife and I'm regulated in the UK and Australia and New Zealand. So in the UK, the Nursing Midwifery Council is well known for over-regulating. They believe they have to keep things safe for the public, but if there is over-regulation, it does the opposite. It makes things unsafe for the public because they don't have access to good nurses and midwives. So I'm currently engaged in some challenges and I recently took a high court appeal case against the NMC in the UK and I won on one of the points. So I'm briefly going to look at a old presentation that's made two years ago. Nothing's really changed. The aspect I may focus on is proportionality, which is what the case was won on. In my view, I would like to win on reasonableness and unfairness. So we'll look at those as well. Throughout this, I will mention psychology, how we can help ourselves. So how, when we challenge, are we being, I don't know, in a drama, sometimes we are and we're attached to it and we're suffering and we're upset with everything, it's quite normal. But is it necessary? So we will look briefly at the psychology as well. I welcome you to challenge and ask questions and send comments. And I'm very informal, I'm just going to briefly go through this presentation and see what comes to my mind that may be of use to other nurses or midwives, not just in the UK, anywhere where you are regulated and you have challenges with the regulator. So we all have human rights, whether we're nurses, midwives, everybody has human rights and they're endorsed by the United Nations. Three basics that I'm focusing on is fairness, reasonableness and proportionality. Employment law supports all this, but we find the law often quite a lengthy and complex process. I'm going to suggest, and perhaps in another video show you how to do quite a simple appeal and get things into court. Compared to dealing with a regulator, the courts are a lot easier, a lot clearer, and they're weighing up proper evidence, unlike regulators, where if you challenge them, they don't even answer your questions. In court, they have to answer the questions, or hopefully. So registrants, we all have the right to know what the allegations are and who the accusers are. That's a fundamental aspect of uh, natural justice. In Britain, it comes from the Magna Carta. And when you've got a regulator saying they've got concerns or allegations, they won't often be very clear. So keep clarifying. And if you don't get a clear answer, you're creating a paper trail of them being unreasonable and unfair, that they have not provided the information that's required by law. So that phrase, required by law is something useful. Instead of I'm asking you this, it's the law requires the NMC to provide this information. By making it more third party, it helps us with our psychology of being less attached, but it also stops us attacking anyone. And there is no us and them, there's only us, we're all in it together. But it can feel like the NMC are the bad guys and we're attacking them. But in psychology, anything we see outside ourselves is really a trigger for inside ourselves. So when somebody does something that annoys us, why does it annoy us? You know, it's probably a trigger within ourselves. So focus on factual evidence. If they don't have it, don't worry too much about your case. For your survival, you do need to find other, possibly even other income and other jobs, but certainly other ways of expressing and enjoying life, not being a victim to a regulatory prosecution, which can feel like a persecution. Hey, that sounds like another trigger. Um, there's some British cases, Sadduk, she's won many cases in the High Court against the NMC. Duffy, she won hers, she was uh, sanctioned by the NMC, she's a midwife. And going way back when it was the UKCC, at that time, the burden of proof was the criminal burden beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's since moved down to on the balance of probability, the civil burden. 
But Jilly Rosser, she put a bleeding woman after the birth in her car because the ambulances were on strike or delayed. And she took her to the hospital. That broke a rule about insurance for transporting women. She was struck off and reinstated by the High Court. It's generally worth making an appeal. However, you have to do it within a month. So if you have any kind of case, it could be an interim order, for example, suspension, uh, conditions of practice. When there's a decision made, you've got 28 days to appeal it. So if you're currently having a case and you didn't appeal something some months ago, but if another event comes up, you then got 28 days from that event, whether it's a, a review hearing, an interim hearing or a final hearing. Internationally, there's other cases. I'm not going to talk about those just now, but it's quite significant to look at um, when prosecutions come. Is it persecution? Is there a fair trial? And sometimes it's criminal cases. So in a fairly recent case in the UK, there was hearsay is often used by the NMC. They don't have evidence. Somebody told them something, maybe in an email or a phone call, and they don't have even a sworn statement. And the judge said there's serious procedural irregularities. The NMC, this lawyer I happen to have dealt with a few times, seems like a thoroughly nice person, but they lie all the time to the NMC uh, panels and to the courts. So when I say they lie, they tell untruthful events, they believe them to be truthful, and they've never fact-checked or verified information, and they will twist the truth in favour of their prosecution. And to some extent, an advocate is meant to present the best case they can, but they're officers of the court. They're, even if they're employed by the NMC, they're not meant to be skewing the truth, twisting the truth, and they're not meant to hide facts that are of benefit to the registrant. And that's what this lawyer and I think all the lawyers at the NMC do this. So it's an institutional mess. Uh, it's been criticised by the PSA, the Professional Standards Authority, and the PSA quite clearly show how the NMC have failed in lots of areas, but particularly two main general areas and I've got information on that if anybody would like. NMC Watch with Catherine Waters, who set it up, uh, says this case shows the importance of a thorough, fair and transparent local investigation by the employer. It also shows the need to ensure local investigations are carried out by independent practitioners not directly involved in the case. It happens all the time if somebody's employed. I will also look at independent people not employed, like midwives, and in general, the problem of hearsay is that the NMC add too much weight to it. They will also add more weight to a member of the public, particularly if they're crying or upset in a panel hearing, they want to safeguard and protect them. They seem to have entirely forgotten their duty of care to the registrant, who they also have to safeguard. They also have to provide safety and not to hound them. And, you know, even form of torture, degrading inhuman treatment is sending emails late on a Friday afternoon encrypted without the password and somebody has to wait a few days to get it or they have to wait many months or years to find out if they have a case. These are breaches of the human rights. So Article 3, right not to suffer cruel and unusual punishments. Article 6 is for fair process and Article 8, the right to private and family life. So all these and discrimination, Article 14, are generally being breached all the time. So particularly if you're a minority, if you're black uh, ethnicity and you're being discriminated against for that or discriminated against for any other protected characteristic, including a belief system and whistleblowing. So it happens all the time. Get the appeals into the High Court. That's my encouragement probably throughout this presentation. So regulatory law and the fitness to practice sanctions can lead to civil and criminal court actions against the registrant. So sometimes a member of the public takes a case, uh, complains because they want to then say to the 
civil courts, oh, look, that nurse or midwife was struck off or suspended. They obviously did something wrong in my clinical care. I now want compensation. So it's very important for us to defend ourselves. We do have a broken regulator. Um, I actually have heard people say that it's, you know, it behaves quite criminally. And the Ockenden reports, the Dr. Bill Kirk up and other reports have clearly shown there were preventable deaths of mothers and babies, Morecambe Bay, East Kent, Mid Staffordshire, and anywhere else where they would do an investigation would probably find preventable deaths of mothers, babies, increased morbidity of mothers and babies, and possibly a few nurses and midwives will have either committed suicide or felt suicidal. In fact, more than a few. It's a very high percentage. And that was some research done by NMC Watch on the mental health impact of fitness to practice proceedings. So are we stuck with a broken regulator? What can we do? Go to court. So create a paper trail. This provides evidence. One quick way to do this is make a subject access request. That's information about you owned by a public body. So we may have forgotten something, previous emails that we've sent them. Just do a subject access request, get all the information for a period of time, look through it, and they will find emails that have been sent to them by others. They will redact some names and details to protect the identity of individuals. But say the manager in the hospital made the complaint about you and there were other emails you never saw. When you've done the SAR, you've suddenly got information. That information is powerful and useful and it's part of evidence against the NMC. Evidence for you in any appeal case. And this is what you need to show a judge. So collect witness reports from others. It could be you had a conversation with a mate, a friend who happens to be a nurse or midwife about an event, and you can turn that into a nice um, statement saying, yes, I remember talking to XYZ on this date, time and place. And they talked about this situation. They said XYZ, and I understand that it's a true account of the events. So that could be useful collect as many of those and also in addition to that is expert witness reports and I have to always say that one lorry driver is an expert on another lorry driver on the reasonable standard of care so we don't need professors PhD nurses and midwives somebody else who can give an opinion on what you did or did not do could be classified as an expert witness report research yep Look up as much factual information to support your case. Demonstrate reasonableness throughout. That's less about opinion and more about fact. I suggest challenge the challenger with education and kindness. Investigate the accusers, not exactly to discredit their evidence, although that's what you do want to do. You're not discrediting them as a person. You are saying their evidence is not strong. It's weak. And why you think it's weak? Ensure the process is transparent, fair, reasonable and proportionate. And again, go to court to challenge it if they fail on these. So do look at the PSA reports. I mentioned these human rights. They're generally breached and we only have the rights we stand up for. If you don't stand up for them, you won't have them. This is a creative opportunity. When I say this, conflict. Uh, the NMC or anything in life giving us a challenge is an opportunity. So quite deep within us is whether we're working from fear or from love. And sometimes it's a mixture. Some people even have fear of love and they're attacking, they're challenging you, saying you did something bad. So what's the motivation of the accusers? Is it professional jealousy? Is it something else? We can't know the mind of someone else, but we can see the actions. That's what we're responding to. We know our own mind sometimes. And hopefully with the help of psychology and having therapy sessions or a cup of tea with a friend, if we're just repeating a narrative, telling a story, that's less helpful than developing awareness, mindfulness, which can come from going for a walk, from yoga, from breathing, from religious practices, spiritual practices. 
that mindfulness and self-awareness can really help us when we're having a challenge. So basically, how we stand up for human rights will encourage others to stand up for all our rights. If I don't stand up for you, who will stand up for me? So the right to private and family life is a very powerful right. I won't go into that just here. Uh, look at the whistleblowing rights. There's health and safety rights. Whenever you find out what your rights are, you simply write it down, put it to the NMC as part of your defence. I had the right to whistleblow, uh, to raise patient safety concerns. I've therefore been discriminated against and treated less favourably by the employer. The employers referred me to you or whoever has, and that's not a proper referral. And if you continue with this, then they're breaching various laws, including your human rights, but we need to take action. So you write something kind of once, maybe twice, maybe three times, but really need to fill in a court form. Again, that can be in a subsequent video about court applications. So just consider those questions whenever you're trying to get more information, whether you're negotiating or even mediating, the who, how, why, what, where, and when, and when you get an answer, question the answer again and again, because you will find out there's usually more information on the second and third questioning that you didn't get the first time. You can develop strategies from mediation. That's a fantastic free book. If you type it on Google as PDF, you will find the whole PDF is free. It came out 30 years ago, but it's still very useful, very relevant, even though it's a bit American with some jargon and references. It's an effective little book. Simple things like, what would it take for you to agree to? Something somebody's just told you they're not going to agree. Very basically asking people how they are and what they would like helps to clarify issues. Also helps us to know how we are and what we would like. I think if we focus more on what we would like instead of what we would not like, it will help create a positive situation. It's just general aspects of a presentation. I go on to talk more about mediation. Again, that can be a separate presentation purely on mediation. But remembering to connect to ourselves, to breathe, to relax, to listen to our bodies, find out what we need to eat, to drink, to rest, to go for a walk. Or we need to write something, but don't send it. If we've written from anger or something like this, probably always best to look at it the next day, edit out the emotion, focus on the facts. By creating positive momentum, for example, when we write to the NMC complaints department, they then have to respond to us. The information they respond with could be very useful evidence later. So create positive momentum by paper trails, by writing things. Personally, I'm a fan of Aikido. It's a gentle martial art, but you get the feeling of it's not your energy that you have to wear yourself down. People use the word fight for many things, fight terrorism, fight cancer, fight the NMC, or fight for women's rights. As soon as it's a fight, there's resistance, there's negative energy. When it's a more gentle, positive momentum, such as in Aikido or mediation, yes, it's philosophical, but it actually is a lot less effort. For example, my own case is that I'm not so attached to, I'm sure I am to some extent, I find them wonderful opportunities. Uh, yes, they can be stressful, but it's a choice really, as is happiness is my responsibility. So I'm choosing to be happy. I'm choosing not to be stressed. That's a negative. I'm choosing simply to be in balance. If I notice I'm out of balance, I do something about it. So creating kindness, even to our opponents. I've just mentioned one of the lawyers, Matthew McClelland, head of fitness to practice. Uh, there's Matthew Cassells, there's um, various other ones. And they are all getting it wrong for years and years and years. They get very well paid and they deserve as any human being our kindness. But it doesn't mean we accept what they're doing. So we challenge what they're doing within their organization and outside their organization to the courts. 
if we can get somebody to agree to talk to us, we're very far along the potential path to reaching an agreement. So get them to engage. And if they don't, you go to a third party like the Public um, Professional Standards Authority, members of parliament, the Health Select Committee, um, you know, various organisations, um, the Information Commissioner, the Ombudsman for Public Health Services. You know, so it sounds like a lot of work, but actually not doing these things has churning over inside us too much um, thinking. So much better, I say, to take action than overthink a problem. So we only have the rights that we stand up for, write our own reports, shoot from the hip, write whatever you want to in a report, then edit it down to make it factual. I suggest if we write articles, doing things on blogs and vlogs and in newspapers or any kind of groups raising the profile that we have a regulator that overregulates that makes it unsafe for the public and for the registrants. So instead of somebody else being the change, you and I, we can all be the change. So focusing on facts, sometimes creating change comes from the potential for embarrassment. So when I've challenged a organization and said, I'm going to take you to court, the threat of litigation has got mediation and the potential for them to be embarrassed and have to pay money just in the process of going to court. And if they lost, they would have to pay compensation or something else. And they're paying usually very expensive lawyers. So in my case where I won one aspect on proportionality, I did not get awarded costs. That's also part of my appeal as, I mean, it might be reasonable not to get the costs, but there's nothing to stop us all asking for our costs. And we can charge so much per hour, so many days, we've spent so many hours. So a small amount adds up to a large amount over a long period of time. So if you've had a case going on for 365 days and you spent one hour a day at I think the rate is 20 pounds um, an hour. That's uh, 700 something pounds. So it's very easy to um, at least attempt to get your costs back. Okay. There's a quote there from Einstein, as I was saying earlier, that conflict creates opportunity. As far as possible, we want to create a win-win. So we help an organization to save face. We're not trying to get them, get the better of them. Maybe we are, but actually we're really looking for fairness. And when we are not trying to hurt our opponent, but to help them understand something with clear legal boundaries, then that is a win-win. Although some hospitals will have treated staff the same way repeatedly, but probably they haven't been challenged enough. Although Croydon had three midwives in a row take the same successful employment law action, and they clearly hadn't learned by the third case, and they probably continued after that. But at some point, a manager is going to say, hey, we're spending money on these legal cases, and we need to sort out why we are offending the staff and losing in the employment courts. By the way, the employment courts are usually very complex on procedure. So it's good to make any application, get into the employment court, get all the help from ACAS, all of that. But it's far simpler, actually, to go to the high court and appeal a decision that's wrong by the NMC. It's much, much simpler. And perhaps I'll do a whole video on the paperwork and process for that. If you would like, give me a comment. So thank you very much. Be positive, positive thoughts, positive actions, positive results. It's okay to be negative. Observe it, be aware of it. It will be less and less. And the positivity comes from being in nature, being in ourselves, being in our breath. I've got some other points that I could share, but let's see if I can stop here and see what comments come. Wishing you all well and wishing you great self-compassion.